Welcome to Lake TV's Community Spotlight Show. I'm so excited because we get to talk some history with our good buddy, local historian, Bill Mulder. Bill, thank you so much for joining us again today. Multiple shows with you because there's so much history to talk about. There's a lot of stuff here in the Lake of the Ozarks region that just fantastic history. Absolutely, man. And you kind of live it, right? I mean, I you love this love stuff. stuff. Yes, I do. <laughs> so do I. Okay, so today we're going to get into some of the early jobs in right. the area, right? But before we do that, we got a picture of uh, of somebody from the Mulder family. So who is yes. this guy? That is Felta Valentine Mulder. Felta Valentine Mulder. And my grandpa, he would have been my great-great-grandfather. My grandfather was Benjamin Valentine. Okay. And, you know, I was pretty thankful after I thought about it. I would not have wanted to go to school with the name Valentine. Right. I would have probably spent a lot of time in <laughs> yeah, it's like having the name Sue, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. the very same thing. Absolutely, well, okay. Well, so that I love the hat. And that hat rocks. Yeah. He, he, he knew how to dress properly. That was a pretty typical dress in the, in the 18, when he came here in the 1800s. He was here before Camden County actually existed. Wow. He would have been here uh, maybe when this was still attached to Gasconade County. So he goes back a little ways. How about that? So your family goes back a long ways in this area. Yes, they do. Uh, they, my family come, the Mulder family come up out of the Clinch River, Tennessee area, yeah. and they split off down there. A bunch of them went to Texas, and a bunch of them come on to Missouri, and then some of them went on to California during the gold rush. Huh. How about that? Well, I see hats run in the family because you got a nice one the there, my All right. So we're talking about early jobs in our area. Yes. Um, and I'm, get, I'm guessing when the lake came into being, it kind of changed everything. The whole dynamic changed yeah. the, so, completely. So what was, what was the industry like before the lake? Well, you know, remember last session we talked about trapping. That was a big thing, and trapping did continue to be part of the, the industry, mm -hmm. but it became more agricultural-based. So growing crops, raising cattle, raising hogs, and if you wanted to add on to that and make even more money because we had this really good crop of, of oak here, mm -hmm. you hacked ties. And in the, the photograph that, uh, that they're showing right now, you'll see that there's this guy, he's out there, he's got a couple of broad axes or tie hack axes, yeah. and he's out there splitting, splitting those So, things. I mean, they, they, they didn't have the big machinery to do this. They were out there by hand hacking this Very stuff Very much by hand, yeah. and that went on year round. So if you can imagine our Missouri summers here at the lake Ooh. with all of the humidity and everything, oh. and you're out there like this poor guy splitting <laughs> those things, and that's how you made your living. And he might only get two or three cents per tie. Wow. So that was, you were pushed to continue to do that. Yeah. Now, while that sounds like it's a low amount of money, that's so you can go to town and buy salt and sugar and things like that that you can't have on your own. Mm -hmm. These folks did subsistence farming, yeah. and it was a very difficult life, but they got by. So they grew their own cattle, they grew their own gardens, and they were very self-sufficient in that respect. But this was a big industry. Missouri actually provided was a tie capital of the nation. I've seen that, and I know I've heard that before. And these ties, what did they use these ties for? That one under the rails. That's okay. what the rails on the railroad set. Sit on, right. Correct. Okay. So okay. that's that's what they're they're doing there. And then they would haul them over to a bluff if they were up high in the hills and slide them down into the water, down into the Osage. And you can still see some of these slides along the banks of the river right now, along the banks of the, the Osage. And they're... And what you're looking for if you're out on the lake and you see a, a big long piece of ground that comes from the top of a bluff to the water's edge, yeah. then that is where that tie slid down. Huh. And they would get those down there. Then they would start making up a tie raft. Right. Now if, you, if you're seeing the picture right now on your TV screen, yep. that is just a small one. Okay. That is a very small so one. So they this, had ones much bigger than that. Those things were uh, quite a bit wider, four or five spans wider, hmm. and some of them were as long as a mile. Okay. They had actually had some trouble moving those down the water if the water was low. Huh. But they, they were huge things. And they sometimes, most of the time, they would go to the Bagnall. Now, as we're looking at the picture here that shows all these tie in that railroad car, yeah. that is old Bagnall on 54 That's the Route town. V. That is the town. Okay. And that is the ties being pulled up out of the Osage 
to be put in those railroad cars and shipped out. How would they pull them out of the river? Was that all again, men were down that there pulling it out? Mules and men. Wow. So you, you had a muscle or two. Makes me feel like a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> These guys worked themselves to death. And uh, looking at the picture, yeah. if you look, you can actually, if you're down by the river in Bagnell and looking back up the street there from the river that is actually the view you're looking at. Wow. The restaurant would be just behind that street, uh, that railroad car. Huh. That is amazing. That is just it's, absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. Stunning. Okay, so that's all pre dam. We are talking uh, with local area historian Bill Mulder. We're talking about uh, early jobs in the area before the dam came in, and, and I've heard about these ties and all that stuff. When I went to Wilmore Lodge, they talk about yes. it a lot. So now I kind of know what it is a little bit. And we'll continue uh, to get more on that and other things that they were doing here in the area Indeed. with uh, Bill right after this. Your car wants to look its best. The paint, the trim, the wheels, the tires, they want to show off in all of their sparkling glory. Let your car shine with the Quick Car Monthly Unlimited Wash Club. For one low price, you can let your car strut its stuff anytime you want. Your car will thank you. Welcome to the club. Quick car. Quick, easy, and professional every time. In Jefferson City and Osage Beach. Your time on the water is limited and High V and Osage Beach knows it. Let us do the shopping so you can maximize your lake time. With our Isles Online app, you can have your groceries delivered or ready for contactless pickup when you arrive to the lake. With all your grilling favorites, snacks, fresh produce, and home to the lake's largest wine, spirits, and beer department, your weekend at the lake starts with High V and Osage Beach, where you'll find a helpful smile in every aisle. Discovered over a century and a half ago, Bridal Cave continues to amaze those who venture through it. As you tour through Bridal Cave, you'll see massive onyx formations, giant columns, and the one and only Mystery Lake. Bridal Cave's unique stalactite-adorned Bridal Chapel has provided a truly unique backdrop for over 3,000 couples from around the world. Bridal Cave is open daily, rain or shine. Guided tours leave every few minutes. Come explore the lake's favorite natural attraction. Explore Bridal Cave today. Welcome back to Lake TV's Community Spotlight Show. We're talking with our good buddy Bill uh, Mulder, local historian, uh, and we're talking about jobs in our area, in the lake area before there was the lake, yes, right? Sir. But we did have the river, so there was still a lot of water. The river was our, our highway of commerce. Yeah. Well, so you were talking about all these ties, and we had a tie raft mm -hmm. uh, where, where they could move the rafts down the water yes. so they could be plucked out and, mm -hmm. and shipped out. Didn't that, like, uh, gum up the waterways for shipping, uh, the ships trying to come through? No, it actually didn't because these things were so valuable, they moved out quickly. Okay. They were pulling those out. And you have to remember, too, that in the wintertime, the Osage would freeze up. Yeah. So that would stop a lot of the tie hacking. This stuff went on mainly during the summer. Okay. Now, some of those old tie hackers would get out there in the hills in the wintertime. They might raft, set a few back. But mainly, this was a summertime job when those things could be moved downstream. Did they move them in the winter? Yes, they did, up until the ice froze the river shut. Wow. And it was a dangerous job. If you were a tie rafter, you could drown really easy because you would fall in the raft, go underneath it, and it was so wide and so long, you might not be able to get out. There were a few drownings. I bet there were. Okay, so tie hacking was a big one. Uh, so, and something I didn't... I've heard the name sorghum, but I didn't know what that was. It's kind of a sugar cane, is that it right? It is a sugar cane. Uh, oh. If you live in the Ozarks and you're a hillbilly native, yeah. you know that uh, when you make biscuits, good big cat head biscuits, uh -huh. that you put some sorghum molasses on your plate, you take some butter that you made from your cow butter, uh -huh. cow cream, <laughs> you mix those together and then you drag the biscuit through it and you eat it. Oh. Sorghum molasses is still available in the stores today. It's a it's a sugar based product. Is it any good? It's delicious. Oh, really? Yes. You you're going to have to go get some after the. I am going to have to go get some. That's just what I need. Uh, more sugar in my uh, in my <laughs> diet. Okay, so we talked about the ties, and now let's talk about uh, the uh, sorghum, which is sugar basically, right? Right. You're right. The the uh, the locals and it would grow cane here. Okay. For sugar cane. And if you squeeze that in a press, now 
the one picture there showing the guy standing in what appears to be a bunch of weeds. Yeah. That is the sugar cane. Okay. There is a high sugar content. It's very similar to the stuff that they grow in Hawaii where our white sugar comes right, from. Right, yeah. It's very similar. So what they would do is they would harvest that, take it back to an area where they had a press. Okay. Now, as we move on to that next shot, you see a, a guy sitting beside this weird contraption. Yeah. There is a mule tied to a long pole. Yeah. That is the press. Okay. So they would take that cane, push it into the press as that mule's walking, and it would extract the sugar, huh. the, uh, the liquid. Okay. We've then seen those things, right? You've, yeah. Yes, you've seen them. And then uh, they would cook that down. Right. And it would reduce it down to this thick molasses. Okay. So if you want to think of it as a, think of it when you, you try to visualize it as, a, as a dark honey, almost a really dark brown honey. Right. But it's a very, it has almost a pungent taste to it. Really? Okay. It, it's, some people do not like it. I've tasted it before, uh, not around here, and I didn't like it. Uh, it wasn't sweet enough for me, right? There is a, a, a sulfur content. Ah. That's probably what you were tasting okay. that didn't agree. Well, that, that would you... explain it. Right. Okay. So, uh, so sorghum was sugar, mm -hmm. cane sugar. Uh, and and uh, so they the, there again there was a lot of work that went into extracting the yep. sugar out of this. It was all hand done by hand. It was a fall project. Well, a fall project. A fall project okay. because that's when the the cane would Harvest. reach its harvestable state. Correct. Okay. So now we've got sorghum. We've got tie hacking. Uh, and then we've got some mining that went on as well. Uh, byrite was there. iron byrite. Correct. Okay. So is this iron? Yes, okay. it is. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it looks, uh, in the picture, it kind of looks strange. It does. It's a, it's a very odd-looking mineral. Yeah. Uh, when I first become aware of it and doing some research, I actually thought it was a, asbestos. That's kind of what it looks like. It does, but it is iron byrite. Okay. And uh, there is iron extractable in that. Okay. And it's done by melting. And if you look at that state map that they're putting up right now, uh -huh. you can see that we were right in the heart it's of iron byrite. big around here. Huge. Yeah. And there are mines all over the area. Huh, okay. And it was uh, it was a very difficult process to mine. I mean, those guys really worked themselves hard, and uh, it was not the safest thing in the world to do either. Okay. So what is a TIF mine? It's the very same stuff. Oh, it is, okay. Byrite is sometimes referred to as TIF. TIF, okay. So they, they were just trying to confuse us. Yes. Okay, good to know. So, and they did some uh, iron smeltering around here too, right? They did. Uh, if you, uh, I think that picture's up on the screen now, what looks to be a bridge abutment, now this yeah. is up on the Osage River. Okay. Uh, that is the one of the few iron smelters that was left after the, what, the lake come in. Now you're only seeing part of the smelter. If you will notice toward the bottom of that structure, there's, there's kind of a triangle above the water line. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a lot of rock that's been put in there. Below that, there's another good 30, 40 feet of that structure. Wow. And that's where they could get their fires built. They would dump that in, that, that byrite in, and melt it down to extract the iron. Okay. And it was, again, all hand done. Wow. So in this area, you had the ties mm -hmm. and you had the iron to make the rails yes, for the railroad. So uh, this was a big, big area during that time. Okay. So we're down to our last few seconds here, but also agriculture. Yeah, was that, was, that was a big thing. That was, that was a sustainable thing that kept you going, whether you sold your product or you didn't. Right. You had to have agriculture. Had to grow your own you, food. You did. Yeah. And uh, this picture that's up on the screen now, You've heard of people looking uh, many years at the uh, south end of a North Brown mule. And that's <laughs> yeah. what that guy's doing. <laughs> and that's how they farmed. There was no tractors, no implements. It was that plow. And that would have been a pretty high-tech plow that that guy's using. You know, I get a kick out of the term horsepower. You know, we got a car with, you know, 200 horse or something like that. That's they trying to equate that to how many horses are in that That's correct. engine, you know, which is pretty amazing. All right. So uh, local historian Bill Mulder, it is always a pleasure to talk with you. This segment, we're talking about jobs in the area before the dam. Uh, we got several segments, uh, more segments that we'll do talking about different areas. But thank you so much for coming in and joining us. And we look forward to the next show with you. Chris, it's always a pleasure. I look forward to the next time.